Hello and welcome to another edition of Momentum. I'm your host, John Bracato. My first guest is Robert Green, undergraduate coordinator for the Bagley College of Engineering. Robert, thanks for being with us. Thanks, John. Happy to be here. I'd like to begin uh, with you telling us a little bit about your office, the role it plays in the colleges, kind of services it provides, and so on. Sure. It's, it's, a, it's a great office. We have a great team, great staff working in there. Um, we basically represent the dean when it comes to undergraduate students and any issues they might have. So we cover everything from petitions and appeals for students who want to get back into school after they've had academic difficulty. Uh, we, we deal scholarships, so we get to, do, we get to have some fun with that. Uh, ads and drops, we do uh, have master class schedule. So we work very closely with the departments and, and the departments we have are all really great people to work with. They're able to solve most of the problems for students may have there. Then the ones they don't, uh, they, they come to us and hopefully we're able to make them happy, uh, <laughs> at least satisfied. And, then, and our ultimate goal is student success. We, we want to see them all graduate and, and go out and be successful engineers. We also handle on-campus events such as orientation and fall preview days, those sorts of activities. So I imagine in this role you get quite a variety of, of student questions. What, what kind of questions do you most commonly get from students? Uh, one of them is, uh, I, I guess the most common is, what should I major in? And uh, the, one, the thing I like about that is I always tell them if I had the answer to that, I'd be on the lecture circuit making <laughs> thousands of dollars for, per engagement. So that's always a tough one to ask. Uh, we get a lot of students in engineering because their teachers have said, oh, you're good at math, so, so major in engineering. So I always like to talk to students about problems, and that's really what engineers do, solve problems. So I try to get them to focus what sort of problems they want to do, and then the hard part is trying to get them to look 20, 30 years out. Mm -hmm. What career do you want? Where do you want to be in 30 years? Not focus so much on what you might do the next four years or what courses are next semester. Uh, as I always tell them, it's, it's sort of like football practice. You know, nobody plays football because they enjoy practice. They, they sign up because they like the game on Friday night and Saturday. Practice is what they do to get there, and that's sort of what college is for engineering, is helping you get to the career you want to have. Right. I, I imagine another question you probably get from people who, who are maybe not as informed is, you know, well, what can you do with an engineering degree? What do you, what do you tell people who ask that question? It, it, there's really nothing you can't do with an engineering degree, and I think that's one of the, the great things about the profession of engineering. It, it basically is educating problem solvers and critical thinkers and how to look at things logically and, and come up with defendable solutions to problems. And every industry is looking for someone to solve problems. Mm -hmm. So we do have a lot of people, uh, I'd say the majority of our students do go into sort of traditional uh, engineering careers, but we have a lot that will go on to professional schools and go into medical school, law school, dental school, and then others go to work in industry, perhaps finance industry, um, just, just any, any place that needs problem solver, somebody who can come in, look at a problem, get a solution to it, and, and move on to something else challenging. And I believe another issue that, that you sometimes deal with is professional licensure. So you probably have some students that ask about that. What do you, what do you say to somebody who, who's thinking about whether to, to, to go after the PE? I always encourage them to pursue licensure. Uh, it, it's a great insurance policy. Uh, you never know where you're going to end up. Um, but if you have a PE license, if you're a licensed professional engineer, uh, you can go into practice for yourself. You can have your own consulting firm. Uh, it's required to submit plans and documents to, to many government agencies. Uh, and the first step in that is taking the fundamentals of engineering exam, which students can do uh, at Mississippi State during their senior year. And I encourage them to do that because the knowledge is fresh in their minds then, easier to pass and do well in that. And then after that, get four years of experience, sit for another exam, the principles and practices of engineering exam, and then you'll become a licensed professional engineer. It just gives you a lot more um, opportunities in your, in your career. A lot of government jobs now uh, are requiring uh, professional licensure. Um, the ABET, our accrediting agency in engineering, uh, really wants to have licensed professional engineers teaching senior design courses. So even if you want to go into a career in academia, having a PE license is, is a good thing to have. Well, Robert, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, John. What drives you? What pushes you forward? Is it an appetite to be the best or a calling to make a difference? For those of us here at Mississippi State University, it's both. 
We're designing a future where cutting-edge hybrid technology isn't imported from overseas, but exported from our own backyard. We're working toward a day when solutions to energy independence move at 0 to 60 in 5.5 seconds and are as simple as charging a phone. A day when fuel economy and environmentally friendly are viewed as less of a compromise and look more like this. For us, turning heads in the auto industry is great, but living up to the hype is even better. That's because it's about more than simply envisioning the future. It's about getting there. And here at Mississippi State, we know just the ride to take. When you're the best, everyone wants to see what you'll do next. At Mississippi State University, our team of world-class rocket engineers is venturing beyond boundaries, building rockets like none before. We're launching a new era of space exploration. We've developed cutting-edge technology that's helping us build a rocket that can travel at four times the speed of sound. Fast? Yes. But more importantly, revolutionary. For you and for a space program that produces many of the conveniences we enjoy today. We're shaping your life in ways you never dreamed. What's next? Watch us and see. Welcome back. My next guest is Randy Niffenegger, a senior physics major from Waldo, Wisconsin, uh, who's about to travel for the solar eclipse. Randy, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. First off, uh, how did you come to be interested in the solar eclipse and where are you traveling? Well, um, I became interested in the solar eclipse about two and a half years ago when I first you know, found out that we were going to have a solar eclipse, especially one this close to Mississippi. Um, and I decided I was going to travel up to the University of, of Missouri. Um, because I have, I have a cousin that goes there, so it's just a nice, you know, uh, nice place to travel to. But if they're right on the path of totality, and um, a lot of people are traveling, so it's hard to find places to stay. So uh, if, if, if you're just you know, seeing this now, it's a little too late <laughs> to make your plans. But uh, yeah, so I'm going to Missouri, right on the path of totality there. Okay. And if you will, scientifically speaking, what, what is actually happening with the solar eclipse and may, maybe what makes it pretend, you know, particularly noteworthy? I guess. Yeah, so uh, a solar eclipse happens every 18 months actually. Um, and basically what's happening is the moon passes in front of the sun and so it makes a very large shadow over the earth. It's basically acting as a very large umbrella. Um, this one's very special though because it's starting, the to path of totality is starting all the way up in Oregon um, near Portland and it's going across the entire nation and exiting in South Carolina by Charleston. And so the entire uh, lower 48 states will have at least 50% total, at least 50% eclipse. So it, it's very spectacular to have a place so heavily populated and well educated like, Amer like you know, America to have this great experience happen. It's a great educational uh, experience as well. Yeah. Okay. And I, observers are being told not to look directly at it. That's something yes. I think most people, people have, have heard, but, but I think uh, less understood is maybe why. So why is that dangerous and what is it, or at least dangerous without, I guess, special glasses and filters? What, what, what's going on there? Precisely, yes. Yeah. So you should only look at it when an astronomer says it's safe to look at it. So that's with you know, glasses or a solar filter. Or there's several different ways that you can look up alternative ways online. Um, but the reason being is because you wouldn't look at directly at the sun during normal circumstances, and you shouldn't look at it now because although you know here in Starkville, Mississippi, we'll have 89% of the sun covered, so that's still 11% of the sun showing, and it's not the sheer amount of light, but it's the intensity of the light that's really damaging to your eyes. So even for a moment, um, for a moment it may not be permanently damaging, but you feel it. it. You see the spots, and it hurts your eyes, 
And so having that, having that damage on your eyes can be very detrimental. It can cause you to go blind or you'll, you'll see little crescents for the rest of your life in, in, your, it's in your retina. It's really, it, it's shocking. You, people go to the eye doctor after major eclipses and they'll see in your eye actually the, the, the image of the crescent of the eclipse um, on the back of their eye. It's, it's, it's rather frightening actually. But wow. under safe, normal, astronomically sound circumstances, it is okay to look at the sun with the proper tools. And around Starkville, should the weather not wholly cooperate mm -hmm. on Monday, what, what can people expect? Are, you know, cl for example, is cloud cover going to be, yes. a, be, be a deal breaker? I guess. So, so cloud cover, although um, it'll be a little disappointing, we won't actually be able to see the sun if it is cloudy or rainy, it'll still get very dark. We're only seeing about 10% you know, of the sun, so it'll get very dark. Um, the birds will start to roost and they'll chirp like crazy. Uh, blossoms will close. So that it'll, it'll feel like you know, nighttime and temperatures will drop. So even if it is cloudy, it'll start to feel like nighttime. It'll start to feel like dark twilight. And so that'll still be a great experience in itself. But hopefully it's a nice clear day um, and we'll, we'll get that, that incredible uh, solar eclipse. And where you're going, you're counting on just basically uh, total darkness. Total darkness. It'll actually be, I know for a fact it'll be dark enough there to see this, and it should be dark enough here. You'll actually be able to look up into the sky as long as you block out with your hand or some eclipse glasses the, the sun, you should be able to see stars and even some planets like Venus in the night sky. And so that's that's where the phrase path of totality comes from, right? Truly. That's the path yes. where it's actually going to be, it's mm -hmm. actually going to be dark the whole way. Yeah. Here in Starkville, we hopefully should be able to see some brighter stars and maybe the, the planet Venus as well. And is, th is this your first eclipse experience? Yes, this is my first eclipse experience. That's why I'm traveling you know, to Missouri and not staying here, just because I, I needed that extra 11%. And also, <laughs> a, a lot of people, you know, they're bringing their, their camera equipment with special filters and things like that. But I, the astronomer in me would be very disappointed if I spent the entire time messing with my camera equipment. So my advice to anyone that this is their first eclipse is just to enjoy it. There'll be another one in 2024 that's intersecting the, the, the nation in a different direction, a little harder to get to. Um, but if you want to photograph one, photograph that one, enjoy this. One. Yeah. And you mentioned being an astronomer. Could you, in closing, sort of briefly describe your role within the department as an astronomer? Yeah, so I'm, I'm the president of the Astronomy Club and I'm the student director for the observatory. So I do, um, I, I run public nights out at the observatory about once a month, weather permitting. And um, we advertise that all through social media. It's just, you know, MS State Astronomy and things like that. And so I help run that. I manage our telescopes. I, I fix things. I, I put things together. And um, I, I mainly, I'm, I'm the voice. I'm doing this exactly. I, I like to educate and you know talk to the you know talk to the crowds, the audience, and and educate the the community because they're very interested. Astronomy is something that everyone can relate to as long right. as you just look up, and so it's a, it's a great learning experience for everyone and it's an enjoyable learning experience. Randy, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. I thank yeah. you for joining us and Thanks safe travels next thank week. You. That's all we have time for today. Remember, you can follow us on social media: uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at MSU Engineering. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>